morning and we have three other sessions in the afternoon. This is the first one. There will be four presentations. Um, one, the first one by Joana Dias, the second one by Pedro Godinho that hopefully will appear soon. The third one by Elisio Hendrix and the last one by Ana Maria Rocha. So you have 10 minutes for each presentation, eight minutes plus two minutes for uh, questions and answers. Um, if you want, you can use all the 10 minutes. Um, the first presenter is Joana Dias. Joana, if you want, you can try to share your presentation. Okay. I will try to share it to see if everything is working. Yes. Meanwhile, I will ask the, the remaining here, the remaining present here to um, turn your microphones off so the sound of Joana is optimal. Um, okay, are you seeing? Yes, perfectly. Okay. And the floor is yours, you can start. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us here in this quite strange <laughs> context. Uh, I think this is my first presentation completely online. Let's see how it, uh, how it goes. So I'm here to, to present a, a work that has been developed by José Carlos Nelas. He is a PhD student. He is working in uh, his PhD in management science, and he is also a nurse. And this information is important because the fact that he is a nurse and he is, has worked for many years in the national emergency medical system is the main motivation for this work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the location problem re regarding emergency vehicles and basically two models that we have developed that are able to calculate robust solutions. So this problem has mainly been uh, uh, motivated by the organization of emergency services in Portugal. And we were motivated to, to do this work because we were not able to find in the literature an optimization model capable of representing several issues, several characteristics of the way the emergency service and the way the vehicles are organized in Portugal. So we have different vehicles. Each vehicle has some kind of, of characteristic and the vehicles are mainly distinguished taking into consideration the kind of support, of medical support that they can deliver they can deliver, for instance, just basic life support or advanced life support, and also by having or not having the capacity of transporting patients to health uh, uh, institutions. Um, one of the characteristics of the way we organize the, the assignment of emergency vehicles in Portugal has to do also with the fact that when a given vehicle is not, uh, um, is not ready to go to, the, to an emergency episode, this vehicle can be substituted by other vehicles that can somehow deliver the same level of care. So what we would like to include in the model were these very important characteristics. We have to consider that there are different types of vehicles capable of providing different levels of emergency health care, we also have to consider the possibility of vehicles being substituted by other vehicles if they can provide the same level of care. Sometimes this means that one vehicle is being substituted by two other vehicles. Imagine, for instance, that I have an ambulance that is capable of providing advanced life support and also transporting the patient to a hospital but this vehicle is not, is not uh, uh, possible to use. So I can substitute this vehicle by two other vehicles. One, for instance, a motorcycle that goes with a medical doctor and with a nurse and is capable of providing this advanced life care and an ambulance that will consider the transportation of the patient to the hospital. So this substitution, substitution is not one vehicle substituting another one. It can also happen that more than one vehicle is going to substitute one single vehicle if that vehicle is not available. And one of the things that we also would like to consider is the possibility of, of uh, uh, having situations that are really very near what happens in the real situation where 
for instance, when an emergency uh, episode occurs, many times more than one vehicle has to go to that emergency episode. And most of the models in the literature consider that one is one single vehicle. So we'd like to, to formulate a model that would help us decide on the best locations for emergency vehicles that should uh, take into account these characteristics. So we have developed a mathematical model and our main objective was to consider a real situation with a possible potential basis for location of the vehicles. And we would like to assess whether the resources that we have, the emergency vehicles that we have, are adequate and if, they, if it's possible to yeah. find what are their optimal locations. And basically do a comparison between the current location of these vehicles and the location that our model would say is the best one. What, what we mean with having adequate resources mean that we want to ensure that the necessary care will get to the patients at the appropriate time when an emergency occurs. So in our mathematical model, we consider that an episode is covered only if it receives all the necessary vehicles of and it receives the necessary vehicles at a given during a given time window. Um, an emergency vehicle, we have to be careful because an emergency vehicle, of course, can only be assigned to two episodes if they don't have any kind of overlapping uh, uh, time uh, periods. Um, we also consider a maximum number of vehicles located in each base, and each emergency vehicle can only be located at one base. Um, this problem is inherently stochastic because it's not possible to anticipate where the emergency episodes will occur. So we have decided to represent this uh, uncertainty using scenarios. So we have developed an algorithm that will uh, generate different scenarios with different episodes occurring and it will try to represent these uh, patterns of emergency episodes occurrence that will resemble what happens in the real life. So we have emergency episodes and in a very, uh, emergency episodes that uh, uh, um, can happen in a random manner. This uncertainty is represented by scenarios. And in one first approach, what we can see there was a model that had as an objective the maximization of the average a number of episodes that were covered. Uh, in reality, okay, this was the first approach, but it can be a very, it, it possibly is not the best approach when we are considering a situation of this kind, where we want to, to assure that we consider the best possible care when emergency occurs. So in this work, we have changed a little bit our uh, first model and we have proposed two robust formulations. So what, are, what is the idea behind these robust formulations? Basically, we want to have solutions that will pretty much work uh, in, a, in a good way whatever the situation that comes to occur. When we consider in a stochastic programming model, when we consider an objective function that is an average of something, sometimes there can be some situations that are, that are, uh, that are not well taken care. And I can have some scenarios that where our solution behaves very, very, very uh, badly. And basically this is not seen when we consider uh, an average value. So we consider two robust formulations. One of them considers the minimization of the maximum regret. So basically we calculate the regret as the difference between our solution and what would be the best solution, the optimal solution for each one of the scenarios that we are considering. And we, what we want is that this difference is as minimal as possible. So I will, I will look at the situation where the regret is maximum and I want to minimize this maximum regret. Another formulation that we tested was the maximization of the total covered episodes in the worst case scenario. So it's basically a max-mean um, uh, solution 
where we look at the scenario with the least number of episodes being covered, and I want this number to be as maximum as possible. Uh, one of the things that we did to test these two robust formulations was to consider both in-sample and out-of-sample results. What I mean uh, when I talk about in-sample and out-of-sample results is the following. Whenever we have a set of scenarios and we calculate an optimal solution, we input these scenarios into our mathematical model, we calculate the optimal solution, and of course that is the optimal solution for those scenarios that were considered in the formulation. But even if those scenarios are really, really a good representation of what happens in real life, we cannot be sure that the performance of the solution will be the one that we are having in this mathematical model, because that solution is the optimal one for that specific set of scenarios. So what we did was, after calculating the solution, we generated another completely different set of scenarios and we tested our solutions in this completely and unseen set of scenarios and we tried to see how the solutions behave and if there was any difference between these two robust formulations in a set of emergency episodes that the solution has the solutions haven't seen before Joanna, you have two minutes, okay? Okay, I'm, I will be very, very fast. So our scenario building uh, considered uh, the center region of Portugal. All those uh, um, black dots that you see there are potential bases for our, uh, um, for our locations of the vehicles. Uh, we have 34 potential bases, 35 existing vehicles. We considered 15 minutes as uh, the coverage limit for urban areas and 30 for rural areas. And we had, uh, and we observed the real data and it was possible to define different regions with different particularities regarding the pattern of emergency episodes that occur in these areas. And so it is possible for us to randomly generate several scenarios considering different types of emergency episodes. Here I'm showing, for instance, two categories, non-trauma and trauma emergency episodes. So what we have found was that the mathematical model works very well. Uh, it uh, really, uh, the, 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 the way we have been able to build the scenarios, we are very glad with that because when we compare with the real situation, they, they really are matching the, the, the scenarios and the real situation. They are really matching in terms of data. And what we, can, what we realized was that looking at the out of sample solutions, it seems that the best model is the one where we are maximizing, where we are minimizing the maximum regret. So it's this model that presents the best out of sample results. And what we also see is that really changing the current location of vehicles can improve the coverage. Uh, of course, that this would be very complicated to implement in practice because, unfortunately, vehicles belong to different institutions. So it will be very difficult for a given institution to, to allow its vehicle to be in another base. Uh, we are very glad with this work and we are currently pursuing new extensions to the model namely considering what happens when the help doesn't reach immediately. And we have, for instance, a deterioration of the patient's health condition. Okay, and that's all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Joana, for this very nice uh, and interesting presentation. Unfortunately, we will have no time left for questions and answers. Um, if you want to... Um, ask something to Joanna, you can use the asynchronous platform Riot. Um, thank you again. Thank you so uh, much. <laughs> Sorry, I was not, I took too much, too much it's time. It's fine, it's fine. <laughs> Eight minutes or 10 minutes is very short. Yes, it's not, um, it's not Pedro Godinho made it and is with us. And I will ask Pedro to share or try to share um, its presentation. It's on the left uh, hand side yes. and say so share your screen. Okay. Uh, I see the share your screen icon, but I'm not being able to, to share. Okay, I think it's... 
Uh, you have to open your... Yes, your it's, it's open. But when I try to share my screen, uh, something odd is happening because... Okay. Hello? I'm sorry. Oh, it's fine. It's working. It's working? Yes. Okay. Uh, are you seeing the presentation? Yes, and you can put full screen and it's working fine. Okay. It's it's full screen now. Uh, yes, full screen it's perfect. Now, it's think. perfect. Okay, thank the you very floor much. is yours. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to apologize for being late in this session because uh, I made some confusion. I thought uh, the timetable is was in Portuguese hours, and I forgot that Italian hours are different. So I was a little late. I apologize for that. I'm going to show a presentation about the shared prediction using machine learning. The, uh, this work was done by Joana Dias, who just finished presenting another work by myself, Pedro Godinho, and by my colleague, Pedro Torres. So what we went to do in this work is to predict, to predict which customers will churn or are more likely to churn in a retail bank and also to predict when they are going to churn. <clears throat> so uh, these are two different issues which uh, we are interested in analyzing. We also wanted to define a new validation methodolo methodology given that uh, churn databases are very highly biased and uh, validation methodology that was applicable to such highly biased data sets and also to apply our methodology to uh, real life data in order to assess its real usefulness. Well, our data set comprised more than 130,000 customers of a Portuguese retail bank. We had two years of data from 2015 to 2017, and we had monthly interactions. Uh, interactions of the customer with the bank concerning product acquisition, product balances, use of bank services. In total, uh, 30, uh, sorry, 63 attributes uh, concerning for each month concerning each customer. We also had personal data concerning, for example, uh, gender, age, location, marital status, and the data was all anonymized because of privacy concerns. The first thing we, we have done was some pre-processing in order to consolidate the attributes, since we had a lot of attributes to reduce the number of attributes with which we were going to work. So we consolidated the initial attributes to uh, end up with just the total value of bank products, the total value of personal loans, the total value of mortgage loans, the number of insurance policies, the total number, number of transactions, and also some binary values concerning the relation of the customer with other banks, namely some variables or some attributes showing whether or not the customer had personal loans, mortgage loans, and bank cards from other banks. Now, uh, this, uh, this is, this uh, graph says, just show some exploratory analysis. We can see that most customers of this bank are single. This graph here shows the uh, date of birth. We also can see that most customers, instead of this being a bank that also works in the web, most customers started their relationship with the bank using uh, bank branch. And interestingly, uh, this graph here shows the relation between the uh, date of birth and the way the customers initiated their relation with the bank. And we can see in this graph that it is mostly the younger customers that start their relation with the bank using the bank branch. And it is older customers that tend to initiate their relation with the with the bank using the web that was against our expectations. 
Now, we also made some exploratory, some initial exploratory analysis using survival curves. Uh, <coughs> we made a lot of different analyses. Uh, two of the most interesting are here. We can see here in the left that uh, customers that started with uh, that started their relation with the bank using a bank branch tend to churn faster than the ones that started it using the web. We can also see that it is the single customers that are most prone to churn uh, in the early stages of their relationship with the bank. We can see it here while it is the married customers that tend to remain most loyal to the bank, that is to churn later. Okay, now we have to define how we identify churn. In order to identify churn, we use a definition that was given to us by the bank, that is the definition that is used by the bank. The bank considers that a customer churns if he or she does not interact with the bank for six consecutive months, if the balance of assets in the bank is smaller or equal to 25 euros, and if the balance of debts is also smaller or equal than 25, 25 euros. So this is the definition of churn that we use, and it is also the definition of churn that is used by the bank. Concerning the methodology, we use the rolling window based methodology in which we try to predict churn in different time horizons. That is, we always use a six months period in order to predict whether or not a customer will churn, but we use this six months period to predict for several different horizons. For example, if we are making a uh, one month ahead prediction, we use the first six months to predict whether or not the customer will churn in month seven. We use months two to seven to predict whether or not the customer will churn in uh, months eight and so on and so on. We also make some two months ahead, ahead prediction and in two months ahead prediction, we use months one to six to predict whether the customer will churn in months eight. Months two to seven to predict whether the customer will churn in months nine and so on and so on. We make the predictions from the months ahead to six months ahead. So we use six different prediction horizons to forecast whether or not the customer will churn. Since we had a highly imbalanced data set, in the sense that less than 1% of the customers shared in the considered two-year period, we have to make some way to balance this sample. So what we did was under sampling. That is, we considered all Scherner samples in the data set you, we used for prediction, and we considered them, we randomly uh, grabbed an identical number of non Scherner samples. So we worked with, in, for, in order to make the forecasts, we work with perfectly balanced samples uh, obtained by using undersampling. In terms of uh, the validation of the results, we used uh, leave one out cross validation. That is, for each sample, for each uh, forecast uh, horizon, we <coughs> grab each element of the sample. Each, um, sorry, for each data set, we grab each sample, we left it out, then we made the model using the remaining samples, and then we applied this model to the sample that was left out. We did that with all the samples that were included in each of our data sets. Pedro, you have two minutes, okay? Okay, I will be faster now. Uh, since uh, additionally we were afraid that customers that churn 
might be easier to identify uh, to identify and in order to avoid any kind of bias we created a second set of samples using only the customer start chart in that two year period <clears throat> notice that uh, it may seem that uh, then we should always predict that the customer will share but in this case we are mostly concerned in, with predicting when the customer will share that is each customer will have a lot of samples concerning the manses in which he did not share and just one sample concerning the manses in which he or she shared we used six different machine learning methods random forest support vector machines stochastic boosting logistic regression card class classification and regression trees and mars multivariate adaptive uh, regression splines and uh, here are the results i will go quickly through the results these results here uh, measure the quality of the forecast using the accuracy we consider that a customer was predicted to churn if the uh, probability if the result of the model uh, exceeded threshold of 0 0.5 uh, 0 0.5 and predicted not to churn if the threshold was below 0 0.5 we can see that the best results were obtained for almost all horizons by stochastic boosting. Now, here we have the measure of the area under the curve. Also, stochastic boosting achieves the best results. Now, uh, for the second, for the samples obtained by second weights, uh, second way that is the samples in which we were mostly concerning with timing that is the samples concerning with just churners we see that the results somehow deteriorate as we were expecting and concerning accuracy CART obtains very good results but if we use the area under the curve instead then it's once again stochastic boosting that achieves the best results and <clears throat> here i had the uh, most important attributes that we were able to identify but since i'm already a little late i will go on to the conclusions so in conclusion we think the methodology we propose uh, achieved very good results in identifying which customers will churn and when they will churn in general, stochastic boosting showed the best performance. And for future research, we think that it will be useful to differentiate costs for churners and non-churners, since the cost for the bank is usually higher if, he, if it wrongly identifies a churning customer as a non-churner than vice versa also we want to use these results to define retention campaigns and also integrate churning prediction with the prediction of the next product to buy and uh, that's all i'm sorry for being late i'm not used to such quick presentations um but uh, that's the most important results of our study Thank you so much, Pedro. Um, the most important is that uh, you arrive on time. Uh, okay, thank you. Very nice presentation. Uh, unfortunately, again, we don't have time. I had a, a very smart uh, question in the beginning uh, that was what churn means, but I guess now everybody knows what churn means. Uh, so if you have other questions, you can use um, Riot to, to address the, the authors. Um, I will ask you to stop um, sharing somewhere in your head. yes and um thank you again and we have to move on to the next presenter which is eligius and eligius you can share or try to share your presentation please yep i'll try to do that 
So I had the same challenge as all the people. No, let's try to depicture something in 10 minutes. No, this is, a, and then without using my usual theater. But perhaps this will reduce all the nonsense that I'm usually saying. There's no guarantee for that, no? So I have to depicture a bit the, the world. No, on the uh, right down, you can see a picture of me made last year for the other XR conference. Uh, Ivo um, improved his uh, picture, as you may see. Uh, he had a nicer background. So Ivo is uh, the guy that has a lot of ideas. And basically, we also have a Pablo, which is our victim, who puts things in Python for us. But he is also a very good sparing partner uh, dealing with uh, writing proofs or theorems. I love this type of stuff. Now, what, we, what is my challenge over here, or why did I write this paper? Because for the last four years, we were doing some difficult things with respect to uh, MINLP. So now you can also see why I didn't. Okay, so I'm doing MINLP, which basically means solving everything in the world. No? Okay. Now, this is the first time I'm working on this type of stuff, because usually all my algorithms are dealing with specific properties of specific problems, okay? But the uh, challenge was given by Ivo when he came four years ago to Braga. It's an inspiring environment for most of you. I know that in Portugal. And his story was, now, MANLP, actually what we have to do is we have to change the world and cut down all the trees. I try to imagine to depicture what I mean with that. So I took a picture over here from, uh, from Baron to depicture a, a little bit what is MILP. That means we have nonlinear stuff and we have integer variables, no? Um, I go to the next slide. There are only 10, so that's the good news, no? So I go to an average book, uh, mainly my own, of course, and I picture a tree, which is a branch and bound tree. So what you observe in the development of algorithms over the last 30 years, if we're talking about MANLP, the focus is mainly on trees. That means on branch inbound, okay? Now, trees are very beautiful, of course, but, uh, okay, deterministic methods are beautiful because they give you uh, a guaranteed solution, no? There's always an epsilon somewhere that will say that you obtained the right solution. We don't know whether this solution will be reached before or after your death. No, that's the, the basic idea, because you will fill up the memory of the computer. No, so this is why um, Evo came with a lot of um, experience he had from Lufthansa, saying, "Let's forget about trees." Now, this is not completely true. Uh, where he went, so he, he backtracked a little bit and said, okay, let's do, let's do subtrees type of stuff. Let's start decomposition. This is a little bit what I want to sketch for today, okay? So decomposition, I didn't find a nice picture that depicts it right for me, so I made this picture myself. It's the idea that we have, uh, we have problems where, it's also welcome, uh, we have problems where uh, we have sub problems where we have small trees over here, very beautiful, uh, that we can solve, and we have global connecting constraints. Okay, that's my story. So that means we are interested in a type of most practical problems have this this property, but also most of the problems in the benchmark of MALP you can translate into that form. So one of the referees was nicely killing me because I, I made a story for one constraint, okay? I'm going there in a minute. Uh, I mean, there's, that's not very practical. That's just the most, easy, um, the most easy instance to depict. That's why I was talking about that. So I made this nice picture. I'm inspired with ideas of Danzig Wolf. That means if you want to solve this type of problems, uh, you have a master problem on the upper level that's going to communicate with uh, uh, sub-problems on the lower level. This is the basic idea, okay? 
Now, how can you avoid growing trees? You have to go for methodology that uh, can handle other types of things, okay? So the, this is a typically Evo slide, I think, right? So we have nonlinear things over here that makes, make these beautiful pictures. As you see, we have integer variab variables over here, but as you may uh, notice that the coupling constraints actually we write down as a polytope. So the master has to do with resources that I allocate over the subproblems actually. And I, I'm thinking here about a linear objective. Okay, the mathematicians would say everything can be uh, translated to this form. No, but um, okay, that's not so important. This is the way to think about it, okay? So I have small blocks, subproblems uh, that have a, a smaller dimension that are dealing with this nonlinearity. I have a, uh, and I link them together by some coupling constraints, okay? Now, what you can you do apart from growing beautiful branch and bound trees? Okay, so this is what I try to depict over here in this slide. And these are ingredients we started to play with. I, I think these pictures I start making directly in the beginning of 2017, uh, discussing sparing with Evo. So this picture gives the idea of uh, what we would call um, an outer approximation, a little bit in a convex way. No, mm, feels good. That means we have separating hyperplanes where you try to enclose your feasible area in such a way that we can run in a master a type of LP type of story. No, that's wonderful. Now, what I learned now with our exercises that actually you can do sim similar things for non-convex guys, right? What I need over there actually is not an LP, but an MIP type of approach, because I have to say whether I'm listening to this constraint or to this constraint over there. So it's a little bit the intuition, right? So this is what we call outer approximation. Then there's other type of tricks we call inner approximation. On purpose, I left it out of the, the paper over here, but this paper is based on a bigger paper where we have all these ingredients in there shooting all the material to this type of problem. What you observe over here on the right is some, some points on the, on the boundary. Why are they on the boundary? Because I was doing linear stuff, okay? And then I'm going to make a convex combination of this stuff. So this is typically called an inner approximation. At the moment, uh, my co-authors are very enthusiastic about combining inner and outer and convergence when everything comes together. Now, there are a few more ingredients I want to, to point to, and one of the ingredients is local projection that I left out over here, but what we do a lot is, okay, you reach a point here and then you try to find a feasible point which is closest, no? Basically, this is an NLP type of stuff. And what I have in this paper for you today is a line search approach. Looks easy because you think, ah, okay, now we're going one dimensional. Now we're happy. Ah, okay. We are still dealing with an MLP over here. Okay. So these are concepts that perhaps you heard about before. I'm pretty certain you heard about uh, decomposition ideas. And perhaps you heard about all these concepts over here. The new thing for today is the resource constraint view. I think this came in two years ago, so then we picked this idea up, saying, okay, now, what I was saying about the master, I can think of B as the resource factor. If I divide that, okay, over the sub-problems, right, if I find the right allocation of the sub-problems, I have a decomposable problem, and I'm ready, I'm solving a number of smaller problems, which in principle we can solve in parallel. No, this was also one of the motivations. Okay, so we reduce the problem to something like, okay, actually what we have to do is to find the right allocation of your resources over the set problem. So also a bit of Danzig Wolf type of idea, no? Okay. The advantage of this idea, and this is the new uh, over here, is that, hmm, this also means a kind of a dimension reduction because before I was talking about NK, 
if I talk about one global constraint, I'm talking about two dimensions. So now you can see why I choose to talk about one global constraint, because now I can make pictures and try to explain something, because three years ago, Umberto was complaining that he didn't understand anything what I was talking about, about simply test. So I, I thought now I have to do better my best and to start to make pictures, okay? I throw this picture at you. So what does it say? This feasible space we have of the subproblems, I'm not translating into a two-dimensional space. So on the x-axis, what you observe over here is the objective function value, and the y-axis over here is the one resource use uh, that we're using. The blue space you may observe over here, perhaps this works, yeah. The blue guys you observe over here is the complete space I have translated from the feasible space up to the, let's say, objective space, okay? You have now two minutes, okay. I'm pushing you two minutes, what you're saying? Yep. Okay, now what I, I'm pushing you into is like a Pareto thing. Now, there are many Pareto fans over here in this club. I'm certain about that. The, 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 the black area here, that are the Pareto points. So I wanted to get that. The green guys are also interesting. They are so-called so uh, green Pareto points, no? You reach them by minimizing a combination of the two objectives now, okay? So most of those area over here, this area, I don't reach when I'm doing the master problem. Okay, let's try to solve this guy. How am I going to solve this guy? I, I want you to get the last minute, I want to get you into the head that they have master problems now, that in fact, what I'm doing, I'm using columns from uh, the sub problems, right? And here's the trick, of course, I have a linear space, but look how beautiful. The, I'm now outer approximating my V space, so not the original space, but the V space. The green lines are so-called cuts. Uh, you can generate them by, uh, by using derivatives. Uh, actually, not derivatives. You use this uh, uh, weights we, we used before. This is also why it's scaled in such a strange way. No, I wanted them to be comparable. Uh, but the first thing you've seen in your life, and perhaps, is that now I'm also outer approximating with this type of strange thingies over there. So I'm using a MIP that uses explicitly the idea of Pareto. As soon as I find a point over here, I know that the optimal area cannot be here. To describe this, I need a master, which is an MIP, okay? Integer program. I need binary values to say I'm up here or, or I'm up there, okay? Okay, so to solve that, that's what I wanted to do with this paper to make an illustration of that, okay? I took another problem which frustrated Pablo a lot and not for nothing. It's a kind of worst case that Ignacio Grossman made a long time ago probably, where I have five of these sub-problems, okay? You can see a little bit what happens here in the first iteration, so I find find an optimum in my uh, outer approximation. I'm doing a line search type of thing and um, I'm ending up here and then I'm outer approximating that. That was actually a little bit of story. So this is my last slide that says, okay, this is what I wanted to illustrate in, in this presentation. Okay, Umberto, I'm in time. Thank you so much, Elisius. Um, very nice presentation. It's uh, not easy to put in simple words um, such a difficult subject. Uh, unfortunately, we are still behind in schedule. So uh, if anyone has questions, you can use Riot to address Elisius. And uh, we move on to the last uh, presentation. Thanks again, Elisius. Oh, um, and Please it's come. Anna that has the difficult task of trying to make it in eight minutes because we need to finish a little bit before 16.30 because the next session starts at 16.30 and they need a couple of minutes beforehand to test. Go ahead, Anna.
It's too small. You need to. Maybe enlarge this? Yes, it's fine. Go ahead. Uh, uh... Just. Are you hearing me? Yes. I have the microphone on. on. Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, I will present a simplified table search uh, with random based searches for bound constraint global optimization. This is a, a joint work with uh, my colleague uh, Fernanda Costa that uh, presented in the morning session and uh, Edith Fernandes. Uh, this is outline of my presentation. I will start with uh, an introduction, then present the simplified table search algorithm and um, then the summary results, and finally the conclusions. So in this paper, uh, the aims of this paper is to present the simplified table search algorithm that uh, only uses uh, random exploration and intensification local search procedures. Uh, the idea is to solve nonlinear bound constraint global optimization problems. Uh, this uh, algorithm uh, borrows ideas from the directed table search. So the main contributions of this algorithm is uh, uh, the exploration and the intensification set procedures, and uh, they only use randomly generated direction vectors uh, while searching in a neighborhood of a, a point, uh, in order to define a set of trial points. Uh, also, in the diversification procedure, um, the points that are inside any already visited region with a relative small visited frequency may be accepted apart uh, from those that are outside the visited regions. So these are the main contributions. Uh, the bound constraint will problem is, uh, is addressed as this form, so you want to minimize a nonlinear function subject to um, a vector of variables uh, that is a bounded feasible that represents, that belong to a bounded feasible region. Um, the global minimizer is represented of this problem, it is, uh, will be represented by x star and the global optimal value by f star. So to solve this problem, uh, we can use an exact or an approximate method. Uh, when we use an exact method, it provides an interval that is guaranteed to contain the global optimal solution. But uh, usually it requires a very large computational effort. When we use an approximate method, uh, it provides a good solution, okay, uh, in a shorter CPU time, but uh, this solution is not guaranteed to be global optimal. Uh, most of the approximate methods are stochastic, okay. The, uh, the stochastic heuristics uh, use random procedures to generate candidate solutions, and uh, they perform a series of operations on those solutions to uh, improve and uh, hope, hopefully get better solutions. Uh, the directed uh, table search uh, emerged to overcome the slow convergence of the meteoristic table search. In the DTS, the directed table search, uh, we have a neighborhood procedure that uses the exploration search procedure, and uh, uh, it aims to generate uh, um, trial solutions, um, but they are based on expensive exact local searches, like the Neldamid or uh, adaptive pattern search. Uh, here it is generated a table list of uh, uh, already visited solutions and uh, defines the table regions uh, to prevent uh, cycling. In the diversification procedure, 
um, the DTS tries to randomly generate new solutions outside the uh, already visited regions. Then it uh, stores a list of the visited regions and the, their uh, frequencies. In the intensification search procedure, it, 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 this is a procedure that is applied in the final stage of the process and it aims to refine the best solution found so far. And it, is, uh, it uses an exact local search strategy. In the presented here, simplified table search that I will denote by STS is mainly, this, this algorithm uh, is mainly based on randomly generated direction vectors. Uh, to search in a neighborhood of a central point. So, uh, here uh, we have also an exploration search procedure uh, to um, provide end trial solutions around the central point. And uh, they are computed, these trial solutions, um, using randomly generated numbers between uh, minus one and one, uh, given a, a positive step size delta. So they are the solutions, the trial solutions are computed by this expression. Uh, if the best of these trial solutions has not improved relative to X, okay, the central point, then the step size delta is reduced. Although uh, otherwise, all the sh solutions are shifted by the same uh, amount. In the intensification search procedure, uh, we will uh, compute n uh, trial solutions again, but uh, based on normalized direction vectors. Uh, sorry, in the, the intensification search procedure, we will. Uh, provide a trial solution based on n normalized direction vectors that are randomly generated um, and computed uh, using this expression where v is a normalized vector with random components between minus one and one. When the best of this point has not improved over the x, the central, Point, then a reduction of delta of the step size delta is uh, is uh, is done, but a moderate reduction, and uh, it should not be uh, below of this one times minus six. However, when the best of this uh, uh, trial solution improves relative to x, then the algorithm resets delta. Okay, to a fraction of the value initially set, uh, only if there was no improvement in the previous iteration. In the uh, during the diversification procedure, uh, randomly generated point Y uh, that is not inside any of the already visited regions is accepted. Uh, and uh, a new visited region is created centered at this point Y, and the frequency is, uh, is set to 1. Uh, during this procedure, also, a randomly generated point Y uh, that is inside any of the already visited region may also be accepted as long as its correspondent frequency is relatively small and then the frequency of the visited region is updated. So uh, one of these uh, um, situations can occur. Um, we, we, test, uh, we test this, uh, um, this algorithm in two sets of benchmark problems. This is the first set of problems with low dimension, and here the second set of problems. Um, in these uh, results, in these experiments, we want to test the efficiency 
uh, and we report the average number of function evaluations required to achieve the stopping conditions. Also, we want to test the robustness, uh, so the rate of successful runs, it is the percentage of runs in which the algorithm obtains a solution that satisfies the stopping condition. Um, this, this value is uh, inside parentheses in the following tables. Uh, this, the average number of function evaluations is only reported um, in relation to the successful, successful runs. Uh, each problem of the first set was solved 100 times and in the, seven, in the second set of uh, 30 times. So we will test uh, the algorithm in two uh, cases. Uh, the case one, when we project uh, randomly the solution into the bounds, the, the feasible region, and the case two, when we project the, the, each of the trial solution to the bound, uh, to the lower bound or to the upper bound. These are the results for case one. Um, so here in this uh, first column, we have uh, our algorithm and we test with these algorithms. Um, here, the stopping condition is given by this, a number, uh, maximum number of function evaluations and uh, a relative value between the best function, best objective value obtained and the best known and the known uh, objective value. So here we can see that uh, is uh, slightly more robust and efficient in general. And uh, this is uh, um, more robust in comparison with this one, the DTS, the original DTS. And uh, it wins in terms of efficiency uh, when compared to this and to this one. When we are um, evaluating uh, the, the second case, you can see also that uh, our algorithm wins on robustness um, when compared to this one and this, okay? And uh, it performs better when com compared to this one. Here we have another uh, stopping condition, okay? This is the difference. And here we compare uh, our algorithm with uh, other algorithms and we can see that uh, case two is slightly more efficient when compared to case one, okay? You can see here the values 100% uh, in almost all and uh, is um, uh, the this one is uh, is more robust in some cases. Okay, uh, conclusions, we can, here we can see some simplifications um, to the table search and uh, some comparison uh, uh, to DTS uh, when uh, 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 some simplifications uh, between the, the DTS in concerning the diversification, exploration and intensification procedures. Um, in our algorithm, when searching the neighborhood of a central point, um, the randomly uh, the direction patterns are uh, randomly uh, generated, solely randomly generated. In the diversification procedure, um, we allow in our algorithm we allow the acceptance of a randomly generated point that falls inside any visited region as long as its frequency is small. And uh, I showed here the new algorithm has been tested and compared to other well-known meteoristics and the robustness and efficiency uh, was tested and the result seems um, seem uh, encouraging. In the future, we want to test um, this algorithm to extend this algorithm to solve uh, general nonlinear constraint problems. Uh, this is, these are some references, and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Anna. Um, we we are just in time to finish this session. So, if anyone has questions, you can 
address uh, Anna using the synchronous platform. And to end this session, I would like to um, thank again all the authors and the present here and in YouTube. And the next uh, session, sec section number three of COA, will start in a minute. Thank you all. And you can continue to assist here on GTC or on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. It's the same. Hello, Chair. Yeah. You need to. Um, Hello. Hello. You changed the role. Hello. Oh, Chair. I don't know how to stop. Okay, maybe stop here. Yes. Now, I don't know if all the speakers are here. Here, now we will start the uh, third session of the um, uh, Computational and Optimization Applications Workshop. Um, we don't have time to a coffee break. Let me see if the first speaker is here. Yes. 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 First speaker, sorry. Pedro Teixeira. Pedro Teixeira. Nice to meet you. Uh, the second speaker uh, is uh, Flavia, Flavia yes. Barbosa. I'm, I'm here, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the third one. I'm here. You're here. Okay. Deborah? Is Deborah? Anna. 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 Okay, Anna. Anna. Anna Hortensio. Yes? Yes. Okay. And the last one, Sandash? Yes. A speaker? Hello? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Good evening, okay. everyone. Yes. Can I ask you to open the, the video? The video, please. Yes. Just take yes. a picture. Yes. All, all in the session. No, they are still in the breaking because it, we we ended the the last session in a minute ago, so they are coming here now. Maybe we can start with the first speaker. So the first speaker, Pedro Teixeira, will present a clustering approach for predicting for prediction of diabetic foot using thermal images. Uh, exactly. You know, you have uh, eight minutes plus five to um questions okay you can okay. start sharing your presentation please i can try to Left push button. i can see yes we can see thank you you can start okay. good afternoon this uh, this study is about a clustering approach for prediction of diabetic food using thermal image and the authors of this work is professors Vital Philippe, Anna Teixeira, and uh, myself. So, diabetics or is a chronic disease characterized by the inability of your body to use its main source of energy, glucose, resulting in decrease in blood glucose levels. Diabetes is a disease for life, which can have serious consequences if not well controlled. So, the International Diabetics Federation estimated that in 2015 there were about 450 million people with diabetes, 
and by 2040 the number would increase it to 642 million, that representing one in 10 adults of the world. Diabetics is one of the most predominant diseases in the world, causing a high number of deaths. So, the motivation of this work is that diabetic food is one of the main complications of observers in diabetic patients and can be defined as infection or ulcerations. Diabetic patients have been 12 and 25 of the risk of developing food ulcers during life. This risk of ulcers is directly linked to an increase of temperature in plantar regions. So several studies of use thermography as a method for automatic identifications of the problems in diabetic food. Infrared thermography is a fast, non-invasive and non-contact method that allows visualizing the food temperature distributions and analyzing the thermal change that occurs. The main objective of this work is to develop a methodology to analyze the diversity of thermal chains in the plantar regions of diabetic and wealth individuals, classifying each food as belong to ADM or to health individual. For these thermographic foods of the plantar are used. These studies could be helped to early detection of injury risk and helping to prevent ulcerations. The methodology of this work has three stages of processing. The after input the, the thermograph, this stage are temperature clustering, index computation, and the classification. The, the first stage of this foot is to divide in regions based on temperature cluster algorithm. So the clustering is the process to identify natural clusters within multidimensional data based on some similarity measures. The, the global objective of this is to group data points with similar characteristics and assign them to the, to the same clustering. In these figures are present two, two sets of images. One is a non-diabetic individual and the, your, uh, the two are diabetic subjects. The, in the second case, that the a diabetic subject is to, is to observe that the distribution of plantar temperature does not follow a specific pattern that uh, is too difficult to measure these temperatures. Because of the concept of clustering and the order to provide a quantitative estimation of the thermal chains in food caused by diabetics, is proposed a new index computation. This index is based on the temperature variation of each cluster, of each cluster in the relation to the reference temperature obtained for the health individuals that uh, is representing the control group. It can be observed in the, the higher index values correspond to greater values of temperature variation, or that can be implying higher risk of the individual developing foot lesions. In the last stage of this method, it's proposed a, a, a binary classification based on the on the index values in the in the in the last stage of this method is selection uh, appropriate threshold that can permit classify classify the thermograms is one of the categories healthy or diabetics. The success of this classification is dependent that the threshold are used. For test the the this classification Thermograms of individuals with and without diabetes are obtained from a public database that contains T334 individuals' plantar thermograms, corresponding at 122 to the M and 45 are to individuals healthy, that is the control group. In this table are, uh, are present the, the, the reference values for the, 
the temperature that can be used in the in the in the index the the this reference is to use it to calculate the index value so during the the fit term analysis it could be observed that uh, when the cluster of fruit have a range temperature very close to the ones of control reference that had in the last table low values of the index are obtained and the widths of server that have a, a butterfly pair depth in this example the first example can be observed is is uh, happens with the uh, the overall of uh, of control group for the fit of the dm group high variations of these values could be observed and the thermal chance can vary from slightly different for the vertical pattern to a completely different and this is reflected in the index as as the variation starts to more evidence in the in the example two the the index values increase moving further and further away from the reference values ctm the hot spots may be even cover the entry planter region reaching a very wide temperature and presenting very wide cte values the example of three so in order to visualize the trade-off between the two positive rate and false positive rate from different thresholds testing is present in the work group this is the this curve and uh, in order to balance these thresholds balance the, the two metric supportings then this sensitivity and say sensibility is proposed a 1.9 to limit to classify the individuals f diabetic or healthy this value as choosing using an approach no uh, point close to zero one corner that is point that minimum distance between between these this is the point that uh, have chosen 1.9 is as the the point to reference so the conclusions of the of this work that the the concept of cluster proved to be an effective approach to help measuring temperature variations in the plant of the feed and the, the index. The present index is able to detect those these variations, indicating that higher risk values correspond to great values of temperature variations, therefore impl implying a higher risk of individual developing food users. So additional the threshold that was determined allows to classify an individual to have a DM or no. Therefore, this work can be contributed for healthy professionals to have access to a classification instrument that can assist in medical diagnostic, elimination of uh, injury risk, and to help in to uh, prevent solutions. In this future work is to uh, intend to classify the thermograms of DMs in multiple categories to help uh, uh, diagnostics and extend the data set in order to balance the number of uh, elements of wealth, healthy and DM individuals. So that's it. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. Very nice presentation. But uh, we do not have time to questions, okay? okay. Maybe in the next session, thank you. Uh, please uh, stop sharing, okay? Thanks. And the uh, next speaker, Flavia, uh, will yes. show numerical analysis of single jet impinging a flat or and non flat plate. Mm -hmm. uh, Start uh, sharing, please. I will try. Left. Okay. Bottom. Yeah, that's it. Okay. You yeah. are able to see my presentation?
Yes. Thank you. Okay, perfect. You can start. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I will present part of my PhD work, uh, which uh, is related to multiple jet impingement. And today I will talk a little bit about the numerical analysis of a single jet impinging a flat and non-flat plate. So this is the outline of my presentation and I will start with the motivation. So regarding that impingement, um, it is used for cooling and heating applications and it consists of direct, directing a jet flow from a nozzle with a specific configuration to a target surface. In, this, in our case, we use orifice nozzle because it presents a better performance in um, case of heat transfer. And why we use this technology, uh, this process, because we are able to achieve high performance for heat transfer enhancement in thermal equipments. So it means that we are able to obtain high average heat transfer coefficients we can uniformize the heat transfer over the impinging surface and in that sense we are able to avoid local and uh, um, hot and cold spots. So uh, as I said, uh, multiple jet impingement is used in several applications. In our case we focus on the reflow soldering process. He here it's a schematic of uh, this process and basically it is a sub-process of the surface mount technology which consists in linked uh, the, in the production of PCBs, so uh, pretty circuit board. So what we want is to fix uh, electronic component to a pretty circuit board. So um, for that uh, the assembly needs to pass through, through a reflow oven um, which is here represented. So uh, our assembly needs to pass through several heating and cooling zones and um, the heat transfer is ensured by uh, the multiple jet impingement which consists on, of hot or cold hair which passes through the nozzles. So uh, in this uh, specific process we have a lot of variables for example, we have jet configuration, jet to jet spacing, the jet diameter, the jet to target interaction, the jet to plate spacing, the jet velocity. Uh, and all of these variables will, um, will improve or, or, or they will act on the performance of the e transfer. So, in our case, uh, in the case, specific case of this study, we will focus our attention in the interaction between the jet flow and the non-flat surface. As we can see, for example, this happens, so this interaction happens, for example, between the, uh, um, an electronic component and the PCB. What we observe here is that the complexity of the flow increases a lot, and this leads to a lot of problems. For example, complicated thermal behaviors, non-uniform cooling and heating, and all these problems can lead to a productivity loss of roughly 30 to 50 percent of the total manufacturing costs. So that means that we need to study this process uh, in order to, at the end, optimize all these variables uh, in order to obtain always the best heat transfer. Uh, we use for that uh, the numerical simulation. Why? Uh, because it allows us to redu reduce uh, the number of experimental tests uh, it, that leads to cost savings and we can improve the process before the manufacturing. For that, we use the computational fluid dynamics uh, in order to predict the fluid behavior before the industrial application. Uh, we use uh, in University of Minho the ANSYS fluid software and the results that we expected to obtain from this study is first of all preventing problems of the process, avoid overheating points and which are regime product defects, improve the reflow soldering process and reduce costs and time. For the numerical simulation, we can apply direct numerical simulation, large CD simulation, but also, also Reynolds average Navier Stokes. This um, last one will be applied and from the RANS, uh, the turbulent model that we will focus on this study is the shear stress transport Kiyomga model because from our previous studies we found that this turbulence model predicts pretty well um, jet, the jet impingement process. Regarding the numerical model and boundary condition that we use in these studies, we are here the, the representation of the flat plate 
um, numerical model and the non-flat plate in the right uh, hand side. So what we have, it's a specific nozzle. As I said, it's a circular nozzle with a specific diameter. And we have um, hair which flows through this nozzle in order to generate the jet. Uh, it, this jet uh, goes through a specific velocity and a temperature of 120 degrees Celsius, and it impinges the flat or non-flat plate, uh, which has a fixed temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. So after the impingement, the flow goes through the outlet, and the, our boundary condition in the outlet is a pressure outlet. So these are the, our results regarding uh, the velocity profile. What we are able to see here is first we are this um, numerical team model um, presents the different um, the different jet flow regions. Uh, for example, we have here the free jet region. After that, we have the stagnation region. Really well predicted in both uh, flat plate and non-flat plate. But we are able to see also uh, the, segment, the stagnation point, which is important. Uh, it is well predicted with this, uh, with this model. And as we can see in the flat plate, flat plate case, we have two stagnation points generated. One generated at the axis of the jet and another at the bottom of the step. So this is, the, this is one of the biggest difference between um, the flat plate and non-flat plate. Here, due to the corner of the step, we are, this leads to generate a recirculation zone. And this is a problem because it can induce cold spot. As you can see, we have a part with lower velocities um, near to the bottom of the step. We are able also to predict the wall jet region uh, with the development of the boundary layer. And in this section, uh, for example, if, if we focus on the non-flat plate, we are able to see an acceleration of the flow over the step surface, and we are not, not able to see this in the flat plate. So these uh, results show exactly the, the increasing complexity of the flow uh, just because uh, of the, um, the step surface. Uh, we have also identified the separation point, which is the moment where the boundary layer leaves the wall. Um, we are able to identify these points um, in the flat plate, but if we focus on the non-flat plate, due to the turbulent generated, uh, these points are moving away um, uh, from the, the, the jet axis. Regarding the temperature profile, first of all, we are able to see that in the flat plate, we, are, we have a uniformization of the temperature profile, which is not the case of the non-flat plate. So we are able to see that all the... Flavia, try yeah. to conclude, please. Yes, we are higher temperature due to the flow acceleration and the recirculation zone, which lead to a decrease in temperature and uh, the for origination, a generation of cold points. So just to finish, this is the nestle number over uh, the wall. And what we are able to see is, first of all, that the peak value is reached at the stagnation point. And here we have an increase of 50% in the step surface compared with the flat plate. Uh, and also an increase uh, between uh, X, G, between zero and two of 10% of the heat transfer average, essentially due to the small recirculation zones and also due to an increasing flow mixing. So these are the conclusion of this work. First of all, we show that the accuracy of the CCG Omega model, since we are able to identify the different jet flow regions, we saw also that the step surface generated an, uh, an acceleration of the flow in the vicinity of the wall, and this leads to an increase of the local and average heat transfer. And we saw also that the corner of the step induces a degradation of the heat transfer if we compare it with the flat plate. We also uh, saw that these effects can be minimized if we applied a jet configuration, and with that, uh, we can optimize the process and minimize cold and hot spots. Um, so we need to uh, work on the optimization of the several uh, process variables. So thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, 
I suppose we have one time, uh, one minute for a question. Do you have any questions or remarks? No? Maybe we should go to the next speaker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flavia. Stop sharing and mm -hmm. Hannah. Um, start sharing, please. My screen. Anna uh, Hortensio will talk about uh, mixed integer linear programming models uh, for scheduling elective surgical uh, procedures. Can you see my screen? Yes, you can start whenever you want, okay? okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hi, good afternoon. I'm Anna Hortensio and I'm here to present the joint work with Deborah Honkoni. Uh, nowadays, hospitals uh, understand. Oh, sorry, I'm not. Okay, no, no, it's okay. Um, nowadays, hospitals understand that they need to improve their productivity. The surgery department is a very important sector in a hospital. Uh, an, eff an effective uh, scheduling can improve their productivity, and some operation research tools can be used in a hospital to enhance surgery scheduling. The problem of surgery scheduling consists of allocation resources to meet patients' needs when and where these resources are required. The hierarchical level we are discussing here is the off offline operational one, which defines the scheduling of no patients considering all resource resources and the sequence of activities. The problem considers uh, uh, multiple operations and resources, a blocking constraints uh, is used to guarantee that uh, resource is, is released only when the patients move to the next operation as shown in this figure. The problems is defined in NP hard. The literature review shows that 78% that of the papers published between 2000 and 2017 use objective functions to manage resources. And two thirds of the reasons of the low efficiency in a surgery department are related to a surgery itself, but one third is related to activity before and after surgery, such as cleaning, setup, uh, preoperative, and postoperative activities. Among all papers analyzed, we choose uh, Pan and Klinkert's uh, that propose a model considering multiple uh, operations and resources. The paper is also has also two objective uh, functions that aim to ma managing resources. This is the model notation. Uh, an important uh, concept that uh, 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 to understand the model is the fictional model. Uh, a model is a group of resources that can pros process a, operation, a patient's operation. The fictional model, uh, it's a model without resources that an attended patient can be allocated. It's as positioned at, at the end of the time horizon and can attend all patients and operation. There is the model. Um, the model uh, uh, objective function has two terms. The first one is mix span, which uh, represents the end time of the last operation schedule. And the second is the sum of all start times uh, weighed by uh, alpha and it's aimed to reducing the number of operations allocated to a fictional model. This group of constraints is used to assign a single model and to each operation. Those determine the time of entry and exit in an oper of an operation. Uh, this group determines that uh, there is no, no time interval between two subsequent operations. Those constraints guarantee setup and cleaning times. Um, these two groups prevent uh, the same resource being, uh, from being uh, scheduled uh, sim simultaneously. Those define the make span value, and those uh, indicate the domain, domain of the decision variable. Analyzing the first term of uh, operation function, make span represent the end of, uh, of the last uh, operation scheduled. And uh, it's defined by this group of constraints. As we can see, those constraints consider the fictional model. 
As shown in this figure, the right make span is the, in the blue arrow, but if you consider the fictional model, the value of make span will be in the red arrow. With these constraints, uh, it's only possible to solve problems without patients unattended. Analyzing uh, objective function, we can see that alpha aims to ponder the two terms. The second terms try to minimize the number of patients allocated to a fictional model. Setting the alpha value, it's not a trivial task. If the value is large, the solution increases the number of patients on fictional model. Otherwise, for a small alpha, the make span value increases. Uh, analyzing the constraints, we find two groups with similar uh, functions, but different structures. We change the, the structures to reduce the number of constraints. Those are the new notation using a proposed model without the fictional model. The objective function is also com, uh, composed by two terms. The first one is make span. The second one is the sum of operations performed. Uh, pounded by J, which is a big number defined, and weighted by uh, priority factor. These are the constraints. Uh, these constraints become uh, an equation without the fictional model. The, we reduce the amount of constraints. Some adjustments uh, were necessary to delete the fictional model. And here, the other constraints using the model. We perform some numerical experiments. The first is the comparative evaluation of the model. The model with asterisk is the Bunn and Klinkert's model with the modified constraints. Uh, we set a time limit for two hours to some instance, uh, couldn't find an optimal solution. Uh, from the proposed model, we find 74% uh, uh, reduction in aberration computational time. Another numerical experiment was uh, the, ana the sensitive analysis. The idea is changing the uh, re uh, resource vi viability to observe the model behaviors. Um, the time, the, the, this table uh, shows the 10 patients instance. As we can see, when we make the system more, more flexible, although the max span can be higher, uh, the number of scheduled patients uh, can increase if we compare it to the base instance. And when the system is more restricted, the number of scheduling patients uh, can reduce and the make span can be worse comparing to the base instance. As final remark, remarks, uh, the literature showed that there, is a, there was a gap uh, for the problem with multiple resources and operations. We studied the, and improved the model proposed by Pan and Klinkert, presenting a new model that works in cases in which not all patients are treated and providing a reduction of, of the computational time. Um, a fi a future, as future work, we suggest heuristics and metaheuristics to solve large instances. Those are the reference, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, 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 time for one question. Everybody understood everything? Just, just to one question because I, I was I had to to leave. Um, which method did you use? Uh, it's a, a model, a mathematical mo model. Yes, and then you use CPLEX, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, CPLEX, yes, we use CPLEX. The exact method. So maybe that's why you have many hours to to get the solution, no? Yeah, we, we put a time limit for the two hours. Okay. Two hours time. Did, did you try, um, have you already tried a meteoristic? Yeah, we are working. We are working in the heuristics. Uh, we have, we already have a, a construct, constructive uh, heuristic, but we are, we will work to in a heuristic met, Okay, you. I, I think you should try. Yeah, <laughs> we will. Thank Maybe you. you get a good solution in a shorter time. Yeah, sure. Thank okay. you.
thank you very much. Um, let's go to the next speaker, please. Um, next speaker is uh, Sandesh. Uh, he will talk about PDA, PDE based dense depth estimation for stereo fisheye image pair and uncertainty quantification. Hello, yes, can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, we can he hear you. Can you start sharing? Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Is it possible? Okay. That's so, okay. So, yes, can uh, start good, yes, good evening, everyone. So today I'll be presenting um, an image processing method for uh, estimating the depth from uh, two pair of fisheye images. So this is a part of research work uh, that was done in uh, in my company, uh, Valio, which is in Germany. So the agenda is first I'll introduce the problem, uh, what's the stereo correspondence problem, how it uh, differs from uh, traditional uh, pinhole and fisheye for fisheye and pinhole cameras, uh, what's the mathematical model that's used, uh, what's the numerical optimization that's been uh, adopted here and uh, finally the simulation results. So let's get started. So stereo matching is like uh, basically you have uh, two pair of cameras uh, which is uh, taking the image of the same scene and uh, each uh, camera observes the perceives the depth at a different position. So this this is seen as a disparity in the image. So you see there's a left uh, image and the camera, I mean, the image uh, captured by the left camera, and this is from the right camera, and uh, the uh, the position of uh, this cone is different in this camera, and it's different in this camera. So this is called the disparity in the two images, and based on this, one can estimate uh, what is the depth of uh, that object. So this is the same principle with which our eyes also work. It's a binocular vision. So um, yeah, we are animals are able to perceive the depth based on uh, the disparity of the image perceived by each each eye. So now uh, what, yeah, so for uh, the stereo image uh, uh, in a pin high, uh, pinhole camera model, what is important is like uh, that there is something called a rectific rectification that happens. So even though the images are distorted because uh, the cameras are in uh, different positions or different angle, uh, yeah, these have to be rectified. That means each line in one image should correspond, in, correspond to the line in another image. So here is the sequence of rectification process. So here in the upper row, you see the, the points are, are like uh, the points of interest are somehow not in a line but this is now corrected for. And uh, in the second step, you see the line is not exactly horizontal. And this is again corrected. And now both uh, the lines of are ag exactly matching. So this is called a rectification process, which is uh, a very important uh, pre-processing step before um, it's fed to the actual uh, depth estimation algorithms. So now in let's come to the fisheye model. So a fisheye camera is a much more complicated lens, um, which involves a different layer of lenses to be able to capture uh, a much wider field of view. So the right la uh, light rays emerging uh, from even from behind the camera is is able to uh, be captured. So um, because of this, there is uh, yeah. So this this is the a graph where you see uh, as the field of view increases, the, that means the theta, which is the horizontal axis, uh, we need to have different types of camera, we need to have a different focal length. That means uh, the point of focus should be, uh, should go keep going behind. Uh, and this, uh, yeah, this results in uh, lesser resolution. So for fisheye cameras, uh, this is avoided. Uh, it's simply by adding more and more layers of lenses. So the result of this is like we get a too much distortion. So you see a fisheye image is distorted and um, a rectification is now has to be applied in order to correct them. So to make these uh, curve lines straight. Now, uh, 
yeah so this is another image uh, where uh, the, there is like a stereo of a left image and the right image and uh, yeah the the scene is slightly distorted here we can see now for okay i can I'll, sorry okay i'll go to the next slide okay I'll switch okay so here again i just want to focus on some point of interest, uh, which is marked as red dot in this upper image. And um, these red dots will appear at a different pixel position on the right image. And uh, yeah, so to be able to, to, so we have to search for this pixel along the curve plotted by, by yeah, along this curve, which is shown in the, in the, in the, second, in the second row. So uh, this is uh, given by the calibration model. Yeah, so we have to, uh, only look for the pixel along this line. And um, the point is we don't want to apply any rectification and we want to do the searching directly on the raw image itself. So this is a much more challenging problem. And um, yeah, it, it has a lot of non-linearities non and we want to address, uh, we want an algorithm which will uh, solve this. So that's the whole objective of this work. So now the problem is now given to left and right images. Uh, which are taken from a fisheye camera, we want to estimate a mapping which gives the depth of the objects in those image. So for this, we uh, uh, employ the energy minimization technique. So for this, we have um, yeah a data fidelity term, which uh, simply computes the difference in the intensities of the two images and the regularizer term. So yeah, uh, the point is like for one of, for keeping one image fixed, that means the left image fixed, and we want to estimate which uh, for each pixel in the left image, where is that uh, pixel on the right image? So there is um, the coordinate function which needs to be computed, and this uh, this evolves as per the nonlinearity of the distortion. So the regularizer term is modeled in this way. It is uh, computed in order to uh, minimize uh depict the surface area of the the 3d object that has been uh, recreated so yeah and another important aspect is like we want to densely estimate the depth that means we want to estimate the depth of the of the, all the pixels that are captured in the image so so in, we get a dense reconstruction of the entire environment so now we the reconstruction of the environment should be in such a way that the surface area should be as small as possible. So that is also one of the objective of the minimization. So uh, this is modeled by this term S. And uh, yeah, this is just uh, something analogous to Brachestrom problem of uh, a line, uh, line curvature minimization. So now the next step we do here is like, since this S is uh, not a convex function of the unknown lambda, we we convexify this uh, by simply taking one by lambda. And uh, so we get a modified regularizer term and we use this to our uh, energy function minimization. So as a result, we get the following Euler-Lagrange equation, which we want to solve. So the Euler-Lagrange equation abstractly can be written in this and in this form and uh, the terms are, uh, yeah, each term for is is uh, takes the following uh, form. Yeah, so a is the nonlinear operator, and f is the f f is the right side term, which is dependent on lambda. So finally, we want to solve this problem, this abstract problem. So this is yeah. So for for yeah. So f f takes uh, uh, this form where uh, the data fidelity term is appearing here with. Yeah. So now we analyze the well-posedness of this. So finally, we get a result saying, okay, this, this problem is well-posed. That means it has a unique solution and can be, uh, yeah, a solution exists and it's unique. So the idea is uh, to apply Lux Milgram and uh, Schauder's fixed point theorem. Yeah, so now, yeah, now, yes, that was, yeah, now we want to uh, consider uncertainty in the model, that means, the data fidelity term, which appears in the F, uh, is is 
is noisy yeah so it is not always uh, something fixed because uh, the sensors induce a lot of noise and uh, we want to uh, model this noise so we include a noise term uh, which we consider as a l2 gaussian random variable with certain covariance operator so now the part of the estimation is we want to like not only do we want to estimate the depth but we also want to estimate the uncertainty of the depth so we want to estimate uh, the distribution of the depth so now we solve this uh, by this nonlinear least squares problem. Yeah, so now let's go to the numerical method used for optimization. So we use the primal dual hybrid gradient method. So consider this uh, abstract problem, and uh, this can be solved uh, using the PD, PDHGMX in the following way. So the, the key observation here is uh, the the line number six, which we uh, make use of in uh, uh, computing the covariance uh, covariance estimate. So for our problem, uh, so the covariance computation making use of the line six, um, yeah, so it requires a se sequence of steps of computation. And uh, finally, we arrive at this expression that the covariance of, of, uh, of, yeah, of the estimate would follow this relation. Yeah, so now having computed all this, now we can finally apply the primal dual algorithm to our problem. Yeah, so uh, for our problem, so we have to again, uh, yeah, I would I would state it again. So it is a nonlinear problem, which has to be solved uh, iteratively for locally, iteratively for every solution we find at every step. So, so basically, yeah, it is, it is, yeah, we get for sorry so excuse me you yes. have to conclude okay yes, yes. so okay. now yes so finally the nonlinear algorithm looks in this way so for every lambda we have uh, we find one uh keeping the right hand fixed we find one optimal solution and then we go on iterating and uh, finally the algorithm should be able to converge yeah so yeah, so now we see the results. So here are some for different scenes. We see the depth. So this is for one scene with the left image, right image, and uh, the estimated depth, and uh, the resampled uh, image that we get, and the variance estimate as well. So we also use the semantic image in order to uh, exclude some of the homogeneous parts and uh, do some uh, good initialization of the solution so that uh, the algorithm doesn't take too long to converge. So uh, yeah, this is for the second scene. So again, uh, this is the estimated depth, the sample image and the variance the image. So this is again for uh, another scene, uh, a realistic uh, while driving uh, scene and uh, the estimated depth and the variance image. So this is, yeah, so on for the fourth image as well. So finally, comparing the convergence and uh, with the ground truth. So for each uh, scene, we see the error converges. So the nonlinear, even though it's nonlinear, uh, because of good initialization and uh, um, yeah, so and also the handling of uh, of the nonlinear terms. So the convergence is achieved. So here the spikes is because uh, for the scene three and four, we take more than uh, Two, two pair of like two images. We compare the, the image uh, with uh, multiple images. So every time a new comparison is done, it's like uh, a new error is is obtained. So this uh, it will be again minimized. So this is required again to uh, avoid local minima problem. So yes. So now this is the comparison with the ground truth. So we see as uh, as we continue the optimization iteration, the the it gets closer and closer to the ground truth. So the ground truth is measured using a laser device to measure the actual depth of the perceived object. Yeah. So and from this, finally, we we will get we will be able to also recreate the three D point cloud, which gives now an approximate uh, model for of the entire environment. Yeah. So yeah. So finally. Yeah, to conclude, so we presented a method to 
do a real time tense depth estimation for given from two or more images so this this method not only provides a way to estimate the depth but also to quantify its uncertainty so we used image segmentation to to be able to identify homogeneous regions and to have a better estimate at these parts and so that we avoid local minima problems and finally um, because we are estimating uncertainty also this way uh, now higher level functionality pro uh, algorithms can make use of this uh, estimated uh, quantities more seamlessly finally thank you for your attention yeah hello. thank you thank you Hello. Yeah. So, if anyone has any questions, I'm open for questions. Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes. Thank you very much. Since uh, you are yes. working uh, on a company, I would like to know what is the direct application um, yes. of uh, this uh, this model. Yeah. So let me just go back to this scenario. So the idea is to yeah this is this, this is now a fundamental step for uh, autonomous driving so we basically the cars have uh, one or two cameras mounted which is very well calibrated and uh, and as the car keeps driving based from uh, the videos that have been or the images that have been captured we want to know what is the depth of the object that means how far mm -hmm. the object is ahead of us so for example in this car so now a car is driving in front of this and um, yeah, the car has to recognize how far this car is or mm -hmm. other objects are to be able to automatically uh, make maneuvers and other high level functionalities. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and uh, so the dense depth, denseness is very much important because uh, here, finally we want to achieve a point something like this a dense reconstruction of the of the environment so like the building has to be recognized as a building car as a car yeah. and in a very dense way so yes so uh, denseness uh, i don't know if anyone is talking hello i guess anna lost uh, connection i don't know yes i lost connection sorry <laughs> Yes. Then I uh, interrupted. Uh, Flavia asked a question that was already answered. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So you can, Anna, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We should uh, close this session because uh, in in about some minutes, we, we will have another session. Okay. Please, Umberto, close the session. Okay. Um, thank you all. Thank you, all the authors of this uh, third uh, computational optimization and application session. Um, and thank you for all the participants. And you are welcome to assist the last one in a couple of minutes. Thank you. And yeah, see thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Continuous session. Um, yeah, it's seven. <laughs> no, let's continue. If you want, you can bring bring coffee and whatever. I go to my kitchen. Bring the coffee. Okay, see you. See you in a minute. I'm going to get watermelon. <laughs>
Finished the watermelon. Again. What's that? Yes, watermelon. If you if you want a little healthy, I, I just did this 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 fluid, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for Anna to start. <laughs> to but she's not awake. I... What? Oh, yeah, she's there. I'm here now. Yeah, two I don't know ago. what happened. I, I mm. lost my connection. Then I think I it was the cleaning was lady. Talking, I was... Anna, it was the cleaning lady because we saw her on the background. Eh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, there's the cleaning lady here. That's why yeah, I saw moved. her on the background. So mine is always hitting the Wi-Fi, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Humberto, we can come here. Can we yeah. eat? Are you sorry? Oh. Uh, that looks uh, like healthy It looks huh? better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> we have to eat that because she looks good, no? Huh? That's it. Mm -hmm. That's the message. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's one minute to go. So uh, right. how, may, um, uh, how long do, do I... How, uh, how many time do I have to... Do my presentation. Twenty minutes. minutes. Five minutes. Five Eight. minutes. Five. Okay. Five. Yes, so, five minutes. E everybody uses ten minutes at least. I need to go for my walk. Revancha. You spent fourteen minutes in the last. Me? Yes. I? Yes. I tried to say two minutes, but I am too polite, and then, I... <laughs> and then you ignore me and continue, which you did, you did well. We have in the top, we have uh, something that we click. Now the, it says nine. I click there and says the, the time for the time of the speakers. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So it's time and we will end up this um, nice workshop with the last presenter, which is um, the workshop share. Uh, one of. Ana Rocha, one of. Uh, Anna Rocha, go ahead, you can share the presentation. Are you like this or like that? No, the previous one. No, the previous one. This one? No. Because when I when I do a full screen, no, it's I fine. stop seeing the, the time. Okay, uh, so I will warn you. So don't I worry. will have all the time. So good afternoon. It's nice to talk to you again now about the single screw extrusion optimization using a Chebyshev scalarization method. Okay, this is a joint work with uh, Marina, uh, my colleague Fernanda Costa. Do you know who is who she is? Uh, Gaspar Cunha, another colleague from the Institute for Polymer and Composites, and Edith Fernandes. So this is the outline of my presentation. I will start with introduction, then the single screw extrusion optimization, the approach you used in this work, and the results, and finally some conclusions. Um, in this work, um, this work aims to uh, the optimal design of a single screw extrusion and it deals the single screw extrusion deals with several performance indices that we call in optimization the objective functions and uh, they are conflicting uh, the sse design concerns the definition of optimal screw geometry uh, parameters uh, uh, for obtaining the best performance indices uh, while manufacturing a certain product. So this is a, a single screw extrusion process it can be seen here in this figure. Okay, here we have some um, uh, the values uh, of the some variables that are used uh, here um, and that are related to the geometry uh, of the extrusion extruder. So frequently the screw geometry is uh, based on uh, empirical knowledge. So we combine trial and error approach 
uh, in order to get the desirable uh, performance indices. Uh, a more efficient approach is to handle the SSD design uh, as an optimization problem uh, where the several conflicting objective functions are optimized simultaneously. Is a previous study, some previous studies uh, concerning this process have already been addressed using multi-objective optimization uh, with the reduced Pareto set genetic algorithm. Uh, in this, uh, this multi-objective uh, uh, approach to the S single screw extrusion design, we will use the weighted Chebyshev scalarization function to optimize the screw geometry. These are the variables uh, related to the screw geometry. And uh, this, is, this will be done using six uh, objective functions, six performance indices that are the mass output, uh, the, temper the um, length, the temperature, the power consumption, the total strain, and the viscous uh, dissipation. So the objective, uh, the single screw extrusion problem is to find a set of values for the for the vector of these variables such that the vector of the objective function is optimized due to the complexity of this problem uh, it will be this problem uh, will be optimized considering uh, two objective functions simultaneously uh, since the mass output, the Q, is the most relevant performance index uh, in the polymer extruder, it, it will be in, in each, uh, in all alternative formulated B objective problems. So, uh, the B objective problems, we have, we will have five problems that, that, uh, that, uh, aim to find a set of values for the vector of the, the geometry, uh, geometric parameters. Um, and each, each of these is a B-objective problem uh, that should be uh, optimized. Some concepts uh, concerning the multi-objective optimization. So uh, in a multi-objective uh, optimization problem, we, the, we aim to find a vector of decision variables that optimizes um, the, uh, fun the functions vector, okay? Uh, the concept of dominance is here, um, uh, is that in the minimization context, a vector is set to dominate another uh, vector F if and only if this, conditions, this condition uh, is achieved. Uh, another concept is the Pareto optimal front that is defined by the um, by this by this set. Okay. Uh, so uh, a solution x1 is said to be Pareto optimal if and only if there is no other solution x2 for which f f of x2 dominates f of x1. Okay, this is the definition of Pareto optimal, and the Pareto optimal front um, is is um, is composed all the points that belong to the that are Pareto optimal. A weighted Chebyshev scalarization method is an approach is an efficient aggregation method that combines the objective functions into a scalar a scalar objective function. So it, it transforms the multi-objective problem into a single objective one, uh, thus giving um, uh, given a vector of non-negative weights. Okay, a single compromise solution in this is then produced. So we want to minimize a function like this subject to x belonging to a, a feasible vision. Uh, Z star is the ideal point of the objective space and uh, for a set of weight vectors. Uh, the weighted Chebyshev approach guarantees finding all um, the Pareto optimal solution with the ideal solution Z star. 
Um, it is advisable to rescale or uh, normalized objective functions because they do not have the same magnitude. Uh, this is the, um, the expression that we used to normalize each of the objective function, where uh, Z nad is the nad objective function vector. Uh, this is a, a, a point that is difficult to, to compute in here. It is estimated by uh, the maximum value of the objective function. Z star is also estimated uh, by the minimum value that it could uh, have. These values are here. Uh, these are um, they they won't be they 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 were not uh, being computed but they were estimated by uh, concerning the process of the extrusion okay the extrusion process these are the five problems the five B objective problems that we have. Uh, and they will be solved by simulated annealing method from MATLAB. These are the parameters of the uh, simulated annealing method. And this, this is the Pareto front from the problem one that we want to maximize the output and minimize Z. So here uh, in blue, we have the solutions. Um, because we we did uh, several runs, okay, and uh, in in red we have the um, the Pareto optimal front solutions, okay, in red. Um, from uh, uh, solution D provides the maximum value for the output, and solution A uh, gives the minimum value of the length of the screw required for melting. Uh, two different uh, trade-offs between the objectives can be observed uh, in the points B and C, for example. This is the result for problem two. Uh, we only have four points that are non-dominated solutions in the Pareto front. And the higher the mass output, the higher is the melt uh, temperature. Solutions A and B are the optimal solutions in terms of, in terms of temperature and mass output. Um, now the solutions and in the red but the, the red circles uh, are the non-dominated solutions, and uh, these are the represent A, B, C, D are representative solutions that we select from the Pareto front. Uh, solution problem four. Uh, this is to uh, um, maximize the mass output and maximize the watts. So uh, we have uh, 17 uh, non dominated solutions in the Pareto front, and uh, the maximum value is attained here for this objective and this. Solution D, uh, the mass output, the maximum value of mass output. Um, and in between A and D, we have several trade offs. We chose, we chose solutions B, E, C as representative solutions for this problem. Problem five, we have five, no, five non dominated solutions only. And um, the best value in terms of viscous, uh, viscosity dissipation is attained as solution A and uh, the maximum output uh, at solution B. These are the representative solutions. Um, and uh, uh, always in, in each of the problem, we showed the, um, the, the values of the other performance in this for the geometric parameters that were found in the problem, in the optimization problem. So here you, we use the weighted Chebyshev scalarization uh, to solve the multi-objective problem that emerged from the single screw extrusion design problem. Uh, the direct visualization and of the trade-offs through the solutions of the approximate front 
um, may assist the decision maker in the selection of the crucial um, performance indexes and the crucial the, the better uh, the best or the best solution the best geometric parameter values um, from the experimental studies uh, we can um, conclude that we got uh, good trade-offs between the conflicting objectives and um, also we can conclude that uh, these solutions uh, the, these uh, uh, obtained solutions are meanif me meaningful uh, meaningful in physical terms uh, thanks for your uh, uh, attention um, and uh, i don't know if i took thank you Anna. very nice presentation um i didn't uh, mention the two minutes left because this way you were able to finish uh, just in time um i will ask if anyone wants to ask any question so the bell was ringing here sorry yeah and uh, lots could... of time i don't know housekeeper goes there and see yeah, all, all is fine. Um, I will end up this session and uh, you will end up this workshop if you agree. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you all for assisting this, for watching this last uh, session and uh, um, for participating in this uh, workshop once again. I wish to meet you all next year in presence, not online. Anna, you can end the workshop thank you very much uh, for submitting papers for this session for this workshop for uh, watching this watch this workshop for those that that are in the youtube session uh, for the presenters of the several talks that we had today i want to thank you all and uh, i hope uh, that uh, next year we'll be together in sardinia uh, now in physical not uh, online conference um uh, i i will ask to to open the um, the, the 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 camera if if you can to take a relaxed picture <laughs> if possible uh, and uh, we will meet uh, again uh, in the next in a, in a conference or somewhere I don't know uh, in, a, in a short time. So thank you all and uh, have a nice dinner. In your <laughs> <laughs> you wish. Okay. Thank you all. So clever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the other uh, session uh, participants that were uh, faithful to us, not in presence, but online. Thank you, uh, Cisandra and Anna Cristina. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. See you. Bye -bye. See you if next you time. want to keep talking here, you, you can. Thank you, Frederico. Uh, thank but you, I see, I see thank you. in the stream of YouTube, if we talk. <laughs> yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's wrap this up thank you all oh, okay okay bye-bye okay. bye-bye bye-bye <laughs>